Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the cream of the crop for the younger reader session at Reading Roundup. Um, before we start our presentation, we just wanted to introduce ourselves. I'm Jill O'Connor. I work at the Merrill Memorial Library in Yarmouth, and I'm the Youth Services Librarian. So I work generally um, with grades uh, three through 12. I'm Patty Francis. I am the librarian at Moore Street School in Freeport and Pownall Elementary School in Pownall. I work with students in pre-K through fifth grade. I'm Kathy George. I'm at the Gray Public Library and I am the youth services person there and I've got them from pre-K pre to 12. And I'm Jesse Trachton and I'm the youth services librarian at Skidunfa Library in Damariscotta. And I primarily work with kids um, from newborns all the way up through about 12, 13 years old. Great. All right. So for our presentation, we are going to um, do a, we're going to start this slideshow. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, you will see our presentation as well as the person who is talking. So here is uh, Cream of the Crop for the younger readers. Thanks for joining us. And we're going to give you a little bit of background about how we, uh, we, why this committee <laughs> exists and what we do um, to uh, be here today with you and do this presentation. So uh, how it works is that publishers send many, many books. They send books uh, and generally we look at books with the copyright from the prior year. So for uh, this list that we have compiled, uh, it's copyright 2020. Um, they send them to the Maine State Library and uh, people who participate in book review which can be anyone, any main librarian or literacy specialist or teacher who works with literature um, for grades, basically pre-K or birth through 12th grade. Uh, and the book reviewers attend monthly meetings. And if you want, you can attend virtually and books can be sent to you. Or uh, you actually, we gather um, with COVID, we obviously did most of it, almost everything virtually. But the room at the Maine State Library is open. Uh, there are books there. You can go and select the books that you want to review. Uh, and then uh, you write those reviews, which we put into a database. So um, again, the age levels of the books go anywhere from board books all the way up to chapter books for you know, high schoolers. And, um, and, and the reviewers actually use a star rating, one to five. And any, and then there's also a designation for cream of the crop consideration. And if something is considered uh, excellent, five star or cream of the crop, um, then the group of us, the we four, um, we actually take those books and we reread them. We, if we have, weren't the original reader or reviewer, and then we um, we read them again. We talk about them and we figure out uh, which ones could be cream of the crop. So uh, this is the database. Uh, it is housed with, uh, it's a WordPress um, site. It's housed with Maine State Library and uh, reviewers actually input the review uh, talking about you know, appropriate audience, uh, what is good about it, comparing it to other things. And this is all Maine librarians for basically anyone on the internet, but it's really helpful if you work in Maine to have other Maine librarians reviewing books. Uh, it's of course only the books that we get from publishers. So this is not every book. Not every book is possible and viable and an option. We review what we what we get. Uh, and then um, there is, a, we're gonna put this here. We'll mention it again at the end, is book review for you. Um, yes, anyone can be a book reviewer if you're a librarian or teacher working with kids and books in Maine. Uh, you, um, any book that you review, you get to keep for your library. It is, there are free books for your collection. Um, you, you, again, after you write the review, the books um, then can go into your collection. So this can be a really great way to add books uh, at no cost and uh, for your collection. So Cara Ryman at the Maine State Library is our, um, is the person who oversees this and she can be contacted at her email address or there is a website MSL for Maine State Library, bookreview.org. And there's actually an application right on there. You can apply there uh, and it will show you how uh, there are tools and things like how to write a review and what makes a review a, a nice acceptable review or a good review. Uh, so this can also um, build your reviewing skills. And when you attend the meetings, it also helps uh, increase some collegiality and you know talking to other librarians. It's, it's really fun to see other people and hear what they think about books. 
um, at our meetings, you get three minutes and you just kind of talk about uh, something maybe really great or things are really not great and why, and you kind of do quick book, book talks too. So you can really hone some of the skills that a lot of us use in libraries anyway. And this can be school librarians, public librarians. Um, again, if you work with kids and books, uh, you are eligible to at least apply to be a book reviewer. So that being said, that is, um, and so we are the cream of the crop for the younger committee. Uh, there is a cream of the crop for the older committee that will do a separate uh, presentation, but all of us work together to create one list, which is the cream of the crop annotated list, which you should find either in the connected to this presentation or in the um, link to general documents. And that list has, has um, all of the books that we consider cream of the crop from the board books all the way through chapter books. Our presentation will only focus on the younger and the handout for the books that we specifically talk about here is available linked to this presentation. That being said, let's get started. Uh, we, we sometimes look at the list and we pull out some favorites, some things that seem to work together and we put them into categories and then we talk to you about these books and also how you can use these books, whether in story times or your classroom. And we, um, and we uh, kind of categorize them for you and, and give you a little bit more information. So uh, that is what we're gonna do today. So that being said, Kathy is going to start us off with full steam ahead. Ah. Okay, I've got I've got my notes here, and it's the only way I can keep going, uh, keep on track. So uh, because they're so great. So good morning, everybody. Um, when I first started reviewing for the cream of the crop, um, I really didn't know much. As the years have passed, I've learned a lot as to what goes into a good review, how to get you as excited as I am about these books. In the beginning, I stayed away from nonfiction in any way, manner, shape, or form. Nonfiction was not my genre, and my knowledge of what was good nonfiction and what was min what was not was minimal. And then steam took over, and I slowly got hooked, and the books got better and better. Um, I am by no means an expert. I still love a good picture book, those sweet books, and a good chapter book, but my love of nonfiction has only gotten stronger and stronger. So I'm here today with this year's choices, and I want you to be as excited as I am. The first one is The Secret Life of Viruses, Incredible Science Facts About Germs, Vaccines, and What You Can Do to Stay Healthy by Mariana Tulsa Sistari. Three years ago, this book might not even have been written. We knew the, about the common cold and we knew the, the flu as, the vi as viruses, and they were part of our everyday lives. But as we can see today, as we are doing this virtually, viruses have taken over our lives and they rule our every move. This is that type of book, not one you might just pick up or offer to a young reader. It's not about bugs, trucks, butterflies, but about what viruses are, how they begin, how they operate, and how they are part of our life. Did you know that there are more viruses on the planet than any other being? They're everywhere. They have a very bad reputation, but really only a very few of them cause us harm. Most are capable of extraordinary things like keeping our planet's ecology balanced and getting rid of dangerous organisms. The book goes on to give us all manner of information on full page layouts and they keep the reader engaged and not bored because the illustrations are comic-like and colorful. Once they tell you all the bad things viruses can and have done, then they tell you ways to keep to stay clear of them. There's a test at the end and the ans with answers to see how you did. This might not have been a book a reader will seek would seek out, but it's a book we should all read. I have paired it with Don Brown's Fever Year and his Big Ideas That Changed the World, A Shot in the Arm, and Suzanne Slade's June Almeida virus detective, along with Kate Messner's Dr. Fauci, how a boy from Brooklyn became America's doctor. It's a really interesting book. The next two are similar in nature. We are all made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself, says Carl Sagan. Ada and the Galaxies by Alan Lightman and Olga Pastuvis. I'm not gonna even try and say her last name, is about a little girl who loves the stars. But living in New York City, they're hard to see because of all the city lights. 
Come summer, off she goes to visit her grandparents, where an island in Maine. Waiting for evening is painful, so her granddad suggests a day at the shore, and she discovers all that nature has to offer, birds, shells, the water, the beach. With evening, with evening comes the fog and no stars. So Ada makes do with pictures of the stars and the galaxies they form. Galaxies are lots of stars swarming around one another like bees, like about a hundred billion stars. And the pictures that they use for this are from the actual Hubble, um, from the pictures that Hubble sent back to the earth. Um, conversations about the universe ensue and young readers get their first taste of both earth and sky. To quote, expressive and charming illustrations allow Ada to observe the night sky and its wonders, and it takes place in Maine. This section selection pairs perfectly with Catherine Lasky's She Caught the Light. Wilhelmina Stevens Fleming, another woman of science that very few of us have ever heard of. As the child of a photographer, she was captivated by light, a fascination that would follow her throughout a hard childhood and an even more challenging adulthood. Leaving Scotland at 20, newly married to James Fleming, she disembarks in Boston only to find James has disappeared, leaving her friendless, homeless, and of course pregnant. She's hired as a maid to the director of the Harvard College Observatory for studying the stars. Always curious, she picks up every bit of information she can on the stars, a form of light she has loved since her childhood. Long story short, she became an expert in computing the light of stars. She discovers the horsehead nebula that is found in our galaxy, the Milky Way. She and other women began, begin sorting and classifying stars and cracking the code of their light. She captured the light to help solve the riddle of the universe. And by the end of her life, she had classified over 10,000 stars. Pair these two with any number of books about the stars, galaxies, and the many female astronomers that have not been recognized for their scientific achievements. For instance, Look Up, Henrietta Leavitt by Robert Burley. She also worked at the Harvard Observatory. And Always Looking Up, Nancy Grace Roman, Astronomer by Laura Gal. The next two are connected with the nature we see around us how specific species blend in with their surroundings to protect themselves and to wrap them all up what young naturalists can do to enjoy, protect and study nature all around us. Masters of disguise, camouflaging creatures and magnificent, magnificent mimics by Mark Martin. It's not only full of facts and figures, but is so beautifully illustrated that it could be used in art classes as well as science classes. Madagascar is the home to almost one half of the world's chameleon species, including the panther chameleon, one of 59 chameleon species found nowhere else in the world. The great horned owl is in this book. It's the most common owl found in the Americas from Alaska to Argentina. The three-toed sloth is the world's slowest mammal, so slow that algae actually grows on its fur. The Gabon viper is the has the longest fangs of ever, any venomous snake in the world. It can fold its teeth, its, its fangs against the roof of its mouth when not needed. And the orchid mantis, probably my favorite in this book, doesn't try to hide. It mimics the look of a flower. The insects are attracted to what they think is a meal, only to be eaten for lunch. The animals found and not found in these pages all have unique and impressive ways of staying out of sight. They will change their color or patterns to blend in with the surroundings. They will disguise themselves as sticks or flowers. One even puts on a coat of algae. What's neat about this selection, each animal has a full page spread on their statistics, so to speak, where they're found, their unique characteristics, and all that. Following a double page 
for the reader to find them in their habitat, a seek and find, if you will. Animals found here include not only what I've mentioned, but the African leopard, leaf and stick insects from Australia, the owl butterfly, um, and the, the mimic octopus of the Indo-Pacific. This is a book for readers of all ages, and hopefully one will seek more information on what other animals use to protect themselves. To take a quote from the author illustrator, in a time when their habitats are under threat because of climate change and other human activities, it's up to us to make sure we do all that we can to protect these incredible masters of disguise, even when we can't always see them. And I've saved the best for last, though this is right up there. What's in your pocket? Collecting Nature's Treasures by Heather Montgomery is in a, in a way ties everything together. Montgomery takes our young naturalists, you know them, they bring you all manner of nature, seeds, leaves, rocks, feathers, sometimes with the story of how they obtain these treasures. And it reminds us that the men and women we study and write books about start out as boys and girls we see every day. She introduces a boy who finds a seed pod and puts it into his pocket and reminds us that he grew up to be George Washington Carver. A little girl collecting worms becomes Valerie Jane Goodall. Charles kept killing all of his specimens until his sister convinced him that it was wrong. He let many live and he grew to be Charles Darwin. She takes nine of our best known and loved naturalists and shows readers that they started out just like them. Just enough information for busy minds to keep them interested and let them see themselves in the stories they read. You can pair this with all of the individual persons and encourage your readers to add to the list. So there is um, Mariani, Charles Darwin, One Beetle Too Many, Jane Goodall, um, George Washington Carver, you can see them along the, the bottom, Meg Lohman, she designs, there isn't a book about her, but she designs methods to study treetops. Oh, I'm sorry, she is. She's the leaf detective by um, Heather Lang. Diego Cisneros Heredia, he's a herpetologist. He doesn't have a book yet um, about him, but he does have a website. And um, in the book, it says that he used to bring his mother snakes for all for her, like her birthday and stuff. Maria, Maria Sibylla Marians, she studies and illustrates the life cycle of butterflies, the bug girl. Bonnie Lee, using chemicals and computers, helped identify a sea slug that had never been recognized by science. And William Beebe, he studied underwater sea life in a bathosphere, Into the Deep by David Sheldon. She also has a pinpoint biography in the back of the book and a note to readers on how to, how to catalog and um, take care of what you're collecting. This is a must for every school and public library. It can be used in so many ways. It's STEAM perfection. These are just a few of the cream STEAM books that have been written for our young scientists. Please do take a look at Out of the Blue. It's a beautifully, it's on our list. It's a beautifully illustrated, easy to understand walk through the various ages of our Earth's history. It reminds us that it all started in the vast oceans. Whether you're a science bug or not, these nonfiction picture books and the many others that we could not highlight here should be used to foster climate change and introduce to all readers that care about our mammals, insects, birds, reptiles, the seas, the skies, and the men and women who study them. They make us all better caretakers of our earth. So thanks very much. I hope you go right out and get them all. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Patty. Good morning. Uh, I chose to pick books uh, this year to share with you um, that give you joy. Reading for joy means finding the right stories at the right moment. It means reading from the heart, reading what you want to read instead of what you've been taught you should be reading, giving yourself permission to read stories you need to hear, finding your own compass, trusting your own guide. Reading for joy means reading for fun. So often our young patrons, our students are given books to read for an assignment, for a whole class discussion, books that they have to read. 
The books I've chosen to share with you today are great books to add to your reader's advisory toolbox to share with someone looking for a great book to read for fun. The first book I wanna share with you is called The Magical Reality of Nadia by Bassam Youssef and Catherine R. Daly. It's illustrated by Douglas Holgate. There is so much to love about Nadia. She's just such a rich character. First, she's an immigrant having moved from Egypt to America when she was six years old. She loves facts. Often, that means that she stops what she's doing to share a fun fact, whether it's with the reader, whether it's with her friends, or whether it's with her bobblehead dolls. She loves bobbleheads. She's got about 77 of them. Um, she also has a really great group of diverse friends, um, and they refer to themselves as the Nerd Patrol. So Nadia is just starting sixth grade, and sixth grade holds a lot of adventures for Nadia and the Nerd Patrol. Unfortunately, not all of them are good. First, there's a new student who likes to tease Nadia about her heritage. And her heritage is something that she's always been really proud of and she's loved. So she's uh, now getting a new look at about, about how she is seen by other people. There's also a competition to design a display at the local museum, which of course the Nerd Patrol is really excited to take part in. But when Nadia becomes the leader of the group, uh, some of her decisions test their friendships. And then finally, the most unusual part of this story, and this is where the magic comes in, is there's an Egyptian spirit named Titi, and he's really quirky and funny. And Nadia has accidentally released him from her antique hippopotamus locket that she brought back from her summer trip to Egypt. This is an adorable, wacky, quirky story and it has so much to offer a middle grade reader. There's uh, realistic fiction, there's fun facts, there's lots of humor, and of course there's that touch of magic with Titi the Egyptian spirit. Adding to the uniqueness of this book is the format. There is the traditional text as well as paneled illustrations. Um, this is the first book in a series, so don't forget to grab The Magical Reality of Nadia, Middle School Mischief, for when your readers come back begging for more. The next book I want to share with you is reminiscent of Ella Enchanted and Rump. It's called The Legend of Hobart. It's written by uh, Heather Mullally, and this is a really clever and funny take on traditional uh, fairy tales, but this has a hero that we can all relate to. His name is Hobart, and he's 12 years old, and he really wants to change his image. He is tired of being the favorite target for the schoolyard bully, whose name is William the Tormentor. And he's determined to do something uh, heroic so that his friends, his family, his whole village will see him in a different way. And so also he can earn a place at the night school. Well, he has several failed attempts to be heroic in his own village, most notably where he tries to save a little girl from an ogre and she ends up saving him instead. So he decides he has to leave his village and take on the most heroic quest he can think of, which is slaying a dragon. Um, and uh, as he's leaving, his mother says, have fun playing dragon slayer. So the first stop he makes on his quest is to see Mildred the Wise to get advice about his quest. Well, she points him in the direction of the last local dragon at Castle Flame Gone, but she also gives him four items to help him on his quest. They are an error-ridden almanac, an endless bag of turnips, a spool of unbreakable string, and my favorite, Albert the Talking Horse, who is afraid of pretty much everything. On his journey to the dragon lair, uh, Hobart's earnest mishaps get him mixed up in all sorts of adventures in which Mildred's seemingly useless gifts actually come in handy. Nothing turns out quite as he thought it would. This story is really funny. It's heartwarming. Um, it has elements of adventure, a really clever and funny twist on fairy tale elements. But this story also shows the importance of compassion over personal gain. It shows that the underdog can come out on top. This book is a book that I would give to students who want to read fantasy, but they're not quite ready for Harry Potter, um, but they're ready for that higher order reading. 
There are a few other books on the screen that also made our list that I want to mention briefly as um, incredibly fun, lighthearted books to read for that, um, that student that's a uh, higher order thinking, ready for the harder books, but not quite ready for the intense, heavy um, books. So there's Long Road to, uh, to the Circus by Betsy Burden, illustrated by David Small. This is a funny, adventurous historical fiction in which 12-year-old Susie is determined to find her way out of her small town by learning to ride an ostrich. It reminded me a lot of Summer of the Monkeys by Wilson Rawls. There's a place to hang the moon by Albus, uh, Kate Albus. This is a World War II historical fiction, um, but it, it's, it's a book to warm your heart. It's about three siblings who were evacuated to the country star side, um, not only uh, to be safe from the bombing, but also to find their forever homes. And the one constant source of happiness in their life is the warmth of the uh, town lending library and the town librarian. This is a perfect pick for a student who is interested in World War II historical fiction, but they're not quite ready for that emotion heavy, the war that saved my life. And also Amari and the Knight Brothers, which I believe is on um, MSBA for this coming year. It's by B.B. Alston. This is another first in a series. And this is an amazing fantasy story about 13 year old Amari Peters, who's nominated to try out for a, the secretive Bureau of Super, Supernatural Affairs, where she learns about the supernatural world and all of the creatures like mermaids, dwarves, and yetis, and other magical things that are actually real. She also finds out she herself has supernatural abilities. This is a perfect book to hand to your Percy Jackson and Harry Potter fans. Next, I wanna share a beginning chapter book that checks all of the boxes. This is called Jojo McCoons and the Used to Be Best Friends. The author is Don Quigley and the illustrator is Tara Audiobert. Um, this is adorable, silly, and quirky. It's an early chapter book with a different cultural twist. It's about Jojo McCoons, um, and she is an energetic and spunky Ojibwe first grader learning how to solve problems on her own. She has problems at home on her Ojibwe reservations, at school, and with making friends. Um, and she solves all of these problems in funny, often wacky ways. Jojo has many of the same concerns as other first graders and her concerns often turn into funny misunderstandings, ranging from whether or not her cat Mimi will deflate when she gets her vaccinations to why her best friend Fern isn't saving Jojo a spot at lunch anymore. Uh, there's Ojibwe and mischief words as well as cultural traditions sprinkled throughout this story. Uh, the definition of these words can be found in Jojo's glossary at the end of the book. There's also an author's note for further explanations of Ojibwe language and culture. And this is, again, the first in a series. So if you can't get enough of Jojo, there's a second book called Jojo McCoon's Fancy Pants. Finally, I want to share some fresh and fun story time additions uh, to freshen up your story times. The first I wanna share is called, Are You a Cheeseburger? Written and illustrated by Monica Arnaldo. This book is so adorable. It's about this raccoon and his name is Grub. And one night he is digging around in a garbage can looking for something yummy. His favorite food is cheeseburgers and he finds this seed. And the seed says that she's waiting for someone to plant her so that she can grow into something special. Well, Grub is wondering what that special thing could be. Could it possibly be that she'll grow into a cheeseburger plant? So he really wants to find out what uh, seed is going to turn into. So he plants her to find out. And what grows is actually a really special friendship between these two. This book is so funny. The illustrations are adorable and they're a little cheeky. If you'll notice the, um, the back cover there just makes me laugh every time I see it. Um, but there's lots of opportunities in this book for making predictions and for discussion. This would be a perfect addition to a gardening story time, a food story time, or even a friendship story time. A few more fresh story time additions um, are Onesaurus, Twosaurus, 
Uh, this is written by Kim Norman and illustrated by Pierre Collette Derby. This is a totally adorable counting concept book. It is meant to be read out loud and with enthusiastic participation. It's about 10 dinosaurs playing hide and seek, and it would make a roaring addition to any dinosaur story time. There's also Sheepish, Wolf Undercover, which is not your typical wolf and sheep uh, book. It's written and illustrated by Helen Yoon. Wolf dresses up like a sheep and sneaks into the sheep's pasture because he wants to get close to the sheep so that he can make some sheep snacks out of them. So he pretends to be one of them and his plan doesn't work out exactly as he planned. This book has very few words, um, but the uh, illustrations are amazingly detailed, and this would make a really great interactive read aloud. Um, it would be a great addition to a friendship story time or stories with unexpected endings. Finally, I want to give a shout out to Mel Fell, written and illustrated by Corey R. Tabor. Uh, this is a Caldecott honoree for this year, and this book is adorable, but it's also clever. It's about a kingfisher who decides that she is ready and brave enough to go catch her first fish. The format of the story is what makes it amazing. And it helps to make the reading experience fun and unique. Uh, there's also an author's note at the back of the book about kingfishers to give young readers context about Mel's flight. Um, this would make a great addition to a bird story time or even an adventure story time. Um, Happy reading, and I'm going to hand it off to Jesse. All right, um, thank you for coming everyone. What I've got for you today is we're gonna talk about some books that I'm classifying as fitting into a, a category kind of identity, belonging, and community. So those books that work as windows, those books that work as mirrors, and also the sliding glass doors. Um, so we'll start with Milo Imagines the World which is a beautifully illustrated um, picture book. It's written by Matt de la Pena and illustrated by Christian Robinson. Probably most people have seen it by now, but it's still so great it's worth mentioning again. Um, Milo is on a bus and he's noticing all of the people on the bus around him. And he's also drawing while he's on the bus and he's using his sketchbook to draw what he imagines the people he's seeing on the bus, what their life is like off the bus. So if you'll notice in the picture illustrated here, there's a woman in a wedding gown um, all the way on the right side and he imagines her wedding and, and what it's like. Um, and he imagines just all of these different scenarios for people on the bus. And then at the end of the book, Milo shifts his perspective and imagines that things could actually be different than he initially thought. So for the woman in the wedding gown, he initially pictured her marrying um, um, a man, and then he thinks that maybe that's not what happened. Maybe she married another woman, or maybe she married um, somebody different. Um, and so this is a really great book for helping kids to understand that things aren't always as they seem. It's also a great opportunity for empathy and compassion. Um, I've got a few read-alikes at the bottom, um, things that just kind of exude empathy. Um, the Carpenter's Helper is a really sweet story about a um, father and daughter who are building and then some wrens move into their bathroom and they decide to wait and let the wrens nest before they continue their construction. Um, also Lunch Every Day, uh, which I believe is on this coming year's Chickadee Award list, which is a phenomenal story that definitely made me cry and picture books don't often make me cry. Um, it's just a beautiful story about really compassion, having compassion for those even who are not the kindest to you. And there's a reason that everybody is the way that they are. The Suitcase is by um, Chris Naylor Ballesteros. And it's a really cool story about, again, perspective and things not always being as you think they are. Um, and then also what is given from the heart is just a, a beautiful story about empathy and compassion as well. So all of these are great. I wouldn't say that any of these would be good for story time because they're a bit longer, but they would be great to do as a read aloud in a classroom maybe, and then have a discussion about perspective and how things aren't always as they seem. So next up, we've got Don't Hug Doug. He just doesn't like it. It's just not his thing. 
Um, I love this book for all the little uh, word bubbles like that. Uh, this is a great book for teaching kids to learn about consent and also about how to set boundaries. So it's, it's okay to not like hugs and it's okay for kids to speak up and say that they don't wanna be hugged. And I think that this book does a really great job of interjecting humor into an important life lesson. So Doug just doesn't like to be hugged. He doesn't like hello hugs. He doesn't like goodbye hugs. He doesn't like surprise hugs. He doesn't like birthday hugs. He's perfectly happy to do high fives. He likes to organize his rock collection. There are all sorts of things that Doug likes to do, but hugging is just not one of them. And so throughout the book, they talk about um, the different reasons that, you know, Doug doesn't like hugs. He feels like they're too squishy and they're a little prickly and they just don't make him feel good. And so it talks about different ways that you can celebrate with Doug about all the different ways you can do a high five about, you know, you can do a happy dance or you can do any number of things, um, but just don't hug him. And then I think at the very end of the book, it says there's one hug that he likes and it's from his mom at bedtime. Um, but it's just a really good book about teaching kids to ask. Um, and I feel like a lot of times kids are often thrust into hugs from adults who don't know how to ask. And so this is a great opportunity for kids to learn that it's okay to say no. Um, and so, yeah, I really like this book. It's, it's, it's funny, it's informative, and it, it, it's, it teaches a good lesson. So some Rita likes to go with that one. Benny doesn't like to be hugged. Um, Benny is on the autism spectrum and doesn't like the stimulation of being touched, but there are all these other things that he loves too. So it's sort of similar to Don't Hug Doug. Um, yes, No is a board book actually. And it's a first, there's a series of board books called from this publisher that are first conversations about, I believe there's one about race and this one's about consent. Um, so it's a board book that talks about when it's okay to, or how it's okay to say yes and no to different situations, even when the person asking you is an adult. Rissy No Kissies. And then finally, um, Consent for Kids, which is a graphic novel format nonfiction book about consent for slightly older kids than these picture books, but still a, a good informative book for kids. All right, moving on. We are moving into the middle grade books. So this next one is called 54 Things Wrong with Gwendolyn Rogers and it's by Kayla Carter. And this is a wonderful book. Um, it's written um, about the main character is Gwendolyn and she is on the spectrum and she has inadvertently seen her IEP and the, her IEP was deemed to be inconclusive but in reading it, she created a list for herself of 54 things that are wrong with her. And um, she recites this list to herself every night. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, she's always trying to be good. She really wants to be good, but she just finds that she can't be good and she doesn't know why. And she blames these 54 things. And so she's always reciting them in her head. Um, this book has very complicated family dynamics. Gwendolyn lives with her mother but there is a boy at her school who she's very good friends with who has the same father as Gwendolyn, but they do not share a mother, but they happen to live in the same town and they are good friends with each other. And um, this boy also is neurodivergent and has ADHD. And so Gwendolyn latches onto the fact that he has his letters. He's got ADHD and she wants to have letters too because he has letters and he takes a pill and it helps him to be good and she wants that too. Um, <clears throat> she does end up going to therapy and getting prescribed some medicine for ADHD, but then it makes her, it, it makes her remember her pencil, which is something that her teacher harps on her a lot about. However, it makes it so she can't feel emotions and she's just not herself. So she may remember her pencil, but she doesn't remember who she is. And so there's a really positive portrayal of therapy in this book in that they try one thing, it doesn't work. She gets a new therapist who is fully supportive of her and helps her mother learn to stop trying to fix her and just teaches her mother how to support her. And so things like going to horse camp, which Gwendolyn really wants to go to horse camp, but her mother has been using it as a reward. So if you're good for X number of days, then you get to go to horse camp. Whereas the therapist teaches her mother, horse camp shouldn't be a reward it should just be something that helps Gwendolyn to um, succeed because she has far fewer behavioral issues when she's at horse camp. 
So it's just a really good book about a neurodivergent character. It has a very positive portrayal of therapy and family dynamics and the struggles that parents have when trying to figure out how to best support their kids. So there are many things to love about this book. Um, I won't talk about all the read alikes. The one I will talk about, which is brand new, is called Anybody Here Seen Frenchie by Leslie Connor. It's fabulous. Um, there's, there are two neurodivergent kids that are the main characters. One of them is completely nonverbal and the other one is sort of the like in your face talking all the time sort of person, but they're best friends. And there are so many um, wonderful things about this book. It's set in Maine and Leslie Connor totally did her research <laughs> because she talked about how overwhelming Rennies could be for neuro neurodivergent kids. And I was like, Rennies can be overwhelming for anyone. <laughs> so. Um, it's a really great story, and I highly recommend it to anyone. I would say 54 Things Wrong with Gwendolyn Rogers is probably good for um, advanced third graders and fourth graders and up. Um, and last but not least, <clears throat> I've got The Samosa Rebellion. And this book is phenomenal. It's set on the fictional item of, or fictional island of Mariposa, and at some point, the government decides that they're going to split people into factions. So there are the butterflies, which Mariposa says butterfly in Spanish. So the butterflies and the moths. So if you are anything less than third generation Mariposa, you are a moth. And so this book brings up all sorts of difficult topics like immigration and xenophobia and racism and bullying because they start detaining people who they've classified as mobs and setting them up in detention camps. They talk about deporting them and how they're going to deport them not to the country from which they came, but to any of a list of, I think, three countries that have said they will accept these um, refugees from Mariposa. So the main character is a young boy whose family runs the, um, what essentially is like the corner store, general store type place. They also serve samosas out of this store. And so he and his family sort of um, begin this like underground rebellion. And the way they communicate with each other is that they pass notes within the samosa. Um, and it's just a really great story of family and community and um, rebellion and um, sticking together and, and, and community good. Uh, it will also make you wanna eat samosas every day. So be prepared for that. Uh, it's really great. I highly recommend it. I would definitely recommend this one for fourth grade and up, maybe even fifth grade and up, just because of the heavy issues surrounding um, the like deportation of family members. The main character's grandmother gets detained and is put into the detention camp. Um, so it can be a little bit heavier. So if you've got a sensitive reader, I wouldn't recommend this one for that one. Some. Rita likes uh, Red, White, and Whole, which is written in verse and is beautiful. Um, the main character struggles with her identity as an American and her identity as, I believe, an Indian person. Um, Santiago's Road Home. I feel like this book does not get enough attention. It's about immigrating into the United States through um, coyotes in Mexico. Orange for the Sunsets, which was on the MSPA list a year or so ago, and Yusuf Azim is Not a Hero, is a fabulous book about a Muslim American and the struggles and triumphs that they have in their American community. So I will leave it at that and um, hand it off to Jill. Great, thanks. All right, so uh, I'm gonna talk about, um, just the general topic is graphic novels, but um, but I will say that I am uh, a champion of anyone's ever, if you've ever been to review, you know that I'm a champion of graphic novels and that uh, graphic novels are, in my opinion, leveraging what kids already like, what kids want to read. And so if you can do that, you're, you're, it's an easy hook. They're already there. They're already asking for them. And so uh, I'm just going to highlight a few of the ones that we put on our, on our list. But I will also just throw out that um, if you are find yourself in the in a position of talking with a parent or a teacher about how they are not, you know, quote unquote, real, real books, or they are the candy, or they are the dessert reads, or any of those things. There's so much research out there about what graphic novels do. And, and when parents say they're not real books, I say, just take out the word real. 
their books. And sometimes it stops them in their tracks and they realize that their kids are reading. All they want to do is read graphic novels. And I said, well, if you just end the sentence after the word read, all they want to do is read. So we have to keep reminding people of that. And here are some great graphic novels to uh, help you hopefully um, to, uh, I don't know, give, give some depth and some weight to uh, what graphic novels do today. These, um, a lot of parents and teachers didn't have books like this when we were readers, when we were younger. Um, there is a, just a wealth of information. So the first one I'm talking about is Stealing Home. It was written by Jay Torres and illustrated by David Namisato. And this is, it's geared toward middle grade. Uh, and it's a graphic novel focusing on a boy, Sandy Sato. And he is a baseball fan and his family is forced uh, in, they live in Western Canada, and they are forced into a um, what they call the relocation camp, and uh, it uses baseball in the story to represent hope in a way that is accessible to a younger reader, and also to interpret uh, how, how horrific the situation is that Sandy and his family find himself, themselves in, and also the relationship between Sandy and his father, which has been a little strained. Um, he is a doctor and is pulled away all the time and feels a really heavy weight of taking care of the people around him in the camp and Sandy and his brother are left to that on their own. Um, there have been many books written about American Japanese internment and prison camps uh, and not too many about the Canadian Japanese experience so and especially one that definitely younger readers could hook into this could be I'm calling it middle grade but I could be I mean second third fourth graders easily could access this book um, and then the older kids maybe could it could be paired with George Takai's they call this enemy which I think is appropriate for probably sixth grade and up um, and, uh, and then there's also the new picture book, Love in the Library by Maggie Takuto Hall, which is illustrated by Yas Imamura. And that one um, is actually set in another, it's an American camp, but um, American prison camp, uh, but it's a nice pairing. And then in terms of just looking at World War II, if you have people who are interested, two other books on our cream of the crop list are the War and Millie McGonagall, like an aimed at kind of more like a fourth through sixth grade reading level. And then When the World Was Ours by Liz Kessler, uh, War and Millie McGonagall by Karen Cushman. Um, when the World Was Ours by Liz Kessler is definitely for an older reader. It's a very heart-wrenching book. Um, these are, those two are both chapter books that give um, a window into the World War II um, experience of the families and the people that were affected, not the soldiers, not the fighters, but the people who are um, left behind. They are wonderful uh, jump starts to discussions, any of these books. Um, into uh, into what was happening during this time for families during World War II. So um, the next one I'm going to talk about is Chunky by Yehudi Mercado. So uh, this one is uh, unique in that uh, Yehudi Mercado is a Mexican American Jewish man uh, person who uh, author who is writing about um, a semi autograph autographical um, no graphic novel here uh, illustrated by by him as well. Uh, about his childhood, he had a heart condition and it led to him um, having being overweight and his father was very athletic and so in a, in a lot of ways naturally suggested to um, Hootie, the main character, that he try sports, different sports. Um, it's not negative necessarily and Hootie is, it's not the classic, oh my dad and my mom are making me do this and I'm so angry. It's okay, I'm willing, I'll give it a try. He's got a very positive attitude. Um, Hootie would rather be doing theater and comedy. Uh, he likes making people laugh. Um, so doing sports is not, absolutely not in his comfort zone. And as you can see from the picture here, uh, oftentimes his accident prone kind of, um, uh, he's um, accident prone and also, uh, what's the word? He's uncoordinated. I mean, he's just not coordinated. And so things bounce off of him into the goal accidentally, but they score and it's the only goal. Um, so lots of things like that. So because he's so willing and because he's so eager and because he's so positive, he actually manifests not an imaginary friend, but an imaginary mascot who cheers him on. And so that is Chunky. Uh, Chunky in the picture there is saying, yay, Hootie. Um, and Chunky also helps Hootie remember that um, it's okay to be who you are and not have to please your parents or whatever society thinks you should be. And so ultimately, when Hootie finds a sport that he is good at, really legitimately good at, um, but it kind of chips away at who he is as a person, Chunky reminds him of that. And so um, the illustrations are bright and colorful. It's 
you know, sports throughout, but also lots of humor, self-deprecating humor, um, like in the only the voice of, of a comedian could do. Uh, so it will really tap into a lot of things that kids um, understand. They understand the pressure of their parents, um, and they understand uh, trying so hard, and 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 then maybe losing pieces of themselves. And so Hootie and Chunky remind you that it's okay to do the things you love. Uh, it's a wonderful graphic novel. It can be paired with with and another thing that um, you can do if you're a librarian or teacher. You can have kids read a graphic novel with this theme of you know finding yourself and being true to yourself. And then you can also pair it with a prose book. So something like Starfish by Lisa Phipps or The League of Picky Eaters by Stephanie uh, Lucianovic. Uh, those two books are also books on our list that deal with um, trying to remain true to who you are despite all the pressures. Um, and there's a lot of um, fat positivity, um, a message of really loving yourself no matter your size in Starfish and also in Chunky. And then Tyronosaurus Dreams is a picture book that you could, you could pair a picture book. You could start with a picture book and say, you know, who does Tyronosaurus wanna be? His parents want him to be a dentist or a lawyer and he wants to be a dancer. So this is a second book from James Howe illustrated by Randy Cecil in a small series um, of dinosaurs doing what they wanna do. Um, but it's a great message. And so you could start with the picture book, there's a graphic novel and there's um, prose chapter books. So all in that same theme, connecting to who you really are. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is Way of the Hive, a honeybee story by Jay Hosler. I've been a huge fan of Jay Hosler. Uh, he wrote um, the, a beetle book that a couple years ago, I think it was on the Main Student Book Award list. Uh, it was a quest book about beetles. And you learned so much about beetles through this adventure quest story. And so Way of the Hive is similar. Uh, it's based on some old black and white um, graphics, like graphic uh, panels and, and little short shorts that he did, that he made, comic strips he made. This has been gathered together and colored. Uh, you can see in the colors, it's beautiful and it's so informative. There's so much information, but there's also kind of a story of like this quest, this bee who doesn't want to go out and leave the hive. It's scary out in the world, but the bee realizes that they have to. It's like in their DNA. And so they have to go do it. And it really cycles through um, an entire bee's life life uh, story and all the way to the end, which is sad. Um, it's heartbreaking and beautifully rendered uh, in pictures and in a way that I think a lot of kids, again, upper elementary, middle school kids, and even high school kids could read. Um, pairing this with Bruno the Beekeeper, a honey primer, which is a nonfiction uh, picture book, also on our list uh, by Aneta Francisca Holosova. Uh, she's Czech um, writer uh, who it's her debut um, book. Uh, it's been translated into English from Andrew Lass. And that is also on our list. And that would again be a wonderful pairing. There's the picture book about, um, <laughs> there's the way of the hive, which is the life cycle of the bee. And then Bruno the beekeeper who actually raises bees to get the honey and collect the honey. So you've got, and then there's a um, chapter book that we considered a nonfiction chapter book, Dana L. Church, the Beekeepers, How Humans Changed the World of Bumblebees. Um, it didn't, I don't think it made it onto our annotated list, but it was a very good read uh, about, you know, for, again, for upper into middle school, into teens, um, for how bees are the essential function of bees and how much we need them. But kids who already like science comics, science comics, uh, I have a picture there of the trees uh, a volume. There are, they are, they are on, they are available in all kinds of topics. Um, kids who I've already got a window into that would love the way of the hive. Uh, and of course you could pair it with any number of um, bee picture books from, these are from past lists, uh, Honey Bee by Candace Fleming and Eric Roman, uh, Bee by Britta Tekken Trap. Mm. I think it's Tech and Trap, Tech and Trap, and then If Bees Disappeared by Lily Williams. So those are informative, more storybook um, flows, gorgeous illustrations, and interesting. B um, by Britta Tech and Trap has cutaways, so you can really get them interested in the topic, and um, you have lots to choose from. So that is um, that's what I have for graphic novels. Um, there are a few more on the list this year, and always more being published. And again. The kids are already there asking for them. It's an easy way to um, get them to read more and go farther into in depth and to convince those teachers and parents that they can actually learn something and get a lot of, out of a graphic novel. And the other thing I always remind people is that kids will read graphic novels over and over again and get more out of it each time. So I'll get off my soapbox and I will tell you that um, we'll go back into, uh, this is just our last slide, resources that are out there. Um, the main children's and YA book review website, we showed a picture of a review. That is something that is accessible to um, 
Yeah, it's MSL bookreview.org. Uh, you can see um, our database of reviews. Uh, we, you know, I recommend things like Twitter and Instagram, following authors, following um, publishers. You find out about books being published. Um, the review journals, Kirkus Review, Horn Books, School Library Journal. Um, there are wonderful websites out there for like, we need diverse books if you're looking to add more multicultural books into your collection. And blogs like the Nonfiction Detectives, which had taken a break. Those are main librarians writing um, reviews of nonfiction books and they're back uh, doing more reviews. Um, you know, look at, ask your readers, uh, go to bookstores and see what's on display, what's being bought, uh, create a, a library network within your town and get together. If you're a public librarian, get together with your school librarian or vice versa and, and see what's going on, what they're collecting, what kids are reading. So, and of course, attending conferences like this and hearing about great new books. Uh, these are all wonderful things to be able to do to add, um, bump up your collecting in your collection development skills. So um, this uh, is our final slide. It is uh, contact ways to contact us. Um, Patty is at the Freeport Pownell Schools. Kathy again is the public librarian at Gray Public. I'm the public librarian at the Merrill Library in Yarmouth, and Jesse is the public librarian at Skidomfo Library in, in Damascata. So I'm going to um, stop the share of my screen. You will once again see all of us. And that concludes our um, presentation for Cream of the Crop of the Young Readers. We hope that you found out about some great new books. You added some things to your interlibrary loan uh, folder or your to be, to be purchased um, lists. So thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of the conference.